Okay, <clears throat> how you guys doing? La 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 la, I pray the Lord Jesus <clears throat> fills my <clears> throat, my chest, my lungs with the breath of life. Grant me perfect health for his glory and anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to yours in Jesus' name. La 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 la, me, 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 I'll pray in a minute. Yeah, guys, as you can see, I'm in a different room. I'm not connected to the router slash modem. And I was right. <clears throat> it is a modem because I got a router slash modem, two in one. Because I want to see if, by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ, it doesn't buffer because... <clears throat> It used to buffer very badly when I first started using internet here. I connected to the router slash modem. It became 99% better. So now I decided to take a chance to see if I could be in my room without using the router modem for internet connection to see if there'll be no buffering. Glory to Jesus Christ. Saturday when I did it, there was no buffering. So we're going to see. <clears throat> Just in case. Hey, stop hating Protestant believer. Just in case it does start buffering badly, what I'll do is I'll reconnect to the router slash modem. So, but I'm hoping it's now fully functional without the router, without the modem, so that I can now do my live streams in this room. I'm close to the street now, so you can hear the cars. If the cars are too loud, let me know. Because Saturday was perfect. Thank the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything perfect and good is from him. And I'm not a young man anymore, guys. I'm going to be 48 if God is pleased, if the Lord Jesus wills. I'll be 48 September 14, if he's pleased to have me around. And as I get older, I can feel my age on my sight. I don't see as good as I used to. And on my voice. <clears throat> my voice is not what it used to be. I remember in my 20s, I could speak for hours and hours and hours. Now... I can speak for several hours and my voice gets tired, gets cracky like right now. And when I wake up in the morning, it takes a little longer to warm up. Hey, quiet. <clears throat> Crackling bros and get on board. <laughs> That's what opera singers do. Yeah. Well, I look younger because I trimmed See, here's the thing. Some people say, keep your beard, and I look older, more distinguished. I shave my beard, and I look younger. No matter what you do, I'm wearing... Me, 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 me. Figaro, 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 Figaro. Figaro, me. You like that, George Fuleri? Yeah. You know, there's a lot of songs I listen to that I like from a variety of genres. But I don't know if there's any one song that I know, know all the words to. So I'm just waiting a few more minutes for the regulars to show up. Pray they show up. Pray more people come. Pray God will bless this session. And pray for me, guys, just that the Lord Jesus will give me such power and such anointing and such discipline and grace from the Holy Spirit that I'll be so filled with the Holy Spirit that I will not succumb to the flesh, that I will die to my flesh, crucify my flesh and my sinful passions, overcome my flesh. For the glory of Jesus Christ. Right? <clears throat> this is why God has called us the community. Let me share something with you about the wisdom of God calling us the community. The Lord Jesus did not call Christians to be alone <clears throat> in isolation. He called individuals to be part of his spiritual body, the church, so that we worship Jesus as a community we worship jesus individually and collectively in other words when we're not with the members of the body of christ we still worship jesus 
We still love Jesus. We still strive to be faithful to Jesus and ask the Spirit to crucify our flesh and not succumb to our flesh and save us when we do. But the Lord Jesus did not call us to serve him alone apart from community. This is why he came to build a church. I want to speak to that real briefly, real quickly. <clears throat> Every individual member of the body of Jesus Christ, the church, is loved with an infinite everlasting love. Jesus loves every member of his spiritual body with an infinite everlasting love. He's absolutely in love <clears throat> with every member of the body of his church. He adores every member of the body of his church, male, female, young, old, free, or slave. He's in love with his church. So he loves you individually, and he loves you collectively. He adores you. <clears throat> the Lord Jesus did not call us to live in isolation with the Bible in our hands, all on our own, me, Jesus, and my Bible. That's not what he did. Even those who live <clears throat> a monastic life, they don't do it alone. Even those who have devoted themselves, let's say, to monasticism. They do that in community, right? They do that in community. You want me there? Even they do it in community. Even they have others, brothers, sisters in Christ, that they worship with, serve with, because Jesus did not call you to be alone. He did. In fact, this is simply a fact. I'm not making it up. There is psychological studies done on this. A person who spends most of his time alone in isolation becomes dysfunctional <clears throat> and becomes a social misfit, in fact, antisocial. Those <clears throat> who prefer to be alone become dysfunctional and are not able <clears throat> to fit in with groups. They become quite awkward and antisocial. <clears throat> And that's not healthy. That's why Jesus called a church, members of his body, being nourished by the head, the Lord Jesus, being filled with the spirit, to be in community, interdependent, depending on one another as we depend on the head to supply all our needs and glorify Jesus Christ. Right? So do not take community lightly. Even here... We're community right now, right? Because of COVID-19, we're not able to gather together physically in one location, but we're gathering together via social media. But you need a church. And for <clears throat> to be honest, the scripture, I don't know why would you say you've never been a groupie, Talitha Kumi. I want to be kind and considerate to you because... You seem to be a sister in the Lord. I'm talking about community and you're talking about being a groupie. I don't know if I should be offended at that comment and if you're mocking and blaspheming Jesus Christ in this church because I didn't know to be part of the church makes you a groupie. Can you now explain to me why you would make that comment when I'm talking about talking about the church? No, no, help me understand. Why would you mention I've never been a groupie when I'm talking about the church and community forming the spiritual body of Christ? Why would that comment? For the life of me, I can't figure out. Sometimes we Christians, man, I, I really don't understand. I'm talking about the spiritual body of Jesus Christ and the importance of community connected to Jesus Christ that we're born of the Spirit, why Jesus came to build a church, the household of the living God, with qualified spiritual leaders to guide it. And someone tells me I've never been a groupie. <sighs> Sister, I am... Uh, 
All right. Uh, Plur uh, Plurum, are you here? Are you here, my friend? Pray that the Lord Jesus will fill us with the Spirit, fill me with the Spirit, fill my chest, my lungs, and my throat with the breath of life, the health I need to glorify Jesus Christ. Okay, Pleromic. Let me explain to you why some people were disarmed by your use of Gnostic sources. Pleromic. I called you Pleroma. Sorry about that. Even your name, Pleromic. <clears throat> Is it a play on Pleroma? Okay. Would you quote the Quran to a Christian to make a point? If you're speaking to a Christian who doesn't believe in the Quran, would you quote the Quran to make a point to the Christian? How you doing, Luisa? How are you, sister? Yeah, I can't win. Some people say, shave your beard, you look young. Some say, keep it, you look distinguished. I'm talking to Pleromic. Okay. So, Pleromic, why would you quote Gnostic sources? To make a point to a Christian. You see why people get upset? And why alarms go off? Because Gnosticism, that's the table, that's the term. Lord Jesus, loosen my tongue. Holy Spirit, take over my words to save me from error. Gnosticism is the term that scholars <clears throat> use to refer to various groups. Traces of which began in the first century that were steeped in Greek philosophy and were influenced by Greek philosophy in thinking that matter was evil, the material universe was evil, the physical body was evil. And so the divine Christ either never became flesh or he assumed <clears throat> never became flesh either because he simply appeared in a human body without becoming flesh or he indwelt the human Jesus and left him at the cross cross so why would you quote a source that talks about the archons to make a point when that's based on the gnostic worldview that tries to make jesus and his followers into gnostics why would you do that when you say you're not you don't limit yourself to the canon then why stop with the gnostic sources why don't you quote the hindu scriptures why don't you quote <clears throat> The Quran or the Hadiths? No, but you did say, I looked at your comments, that you don't limit yourself to the canon. Did you not say that? I don't want to scroll back and quote you because I was reading the comments. Why the Daily Gripe took issue with your citation. Now I see why. Okay. Okay. So then why not then quote the Quran for me, quote the Hadiths, quote the Vedas, Anything and everything to make your point. All truth is God's truth. We know that. But as a Christian, when you want to make a point to another Christian, why would you quote Gnostic sources? You understand the point? Shlama. I'm helping this brother because he's growing in his faith. And I'm helping him. And I'm trusting the Holy Spirit will help me to help him to become more spiritually mature in Jesus Christ. Yeah. Or quote the Book of Mormon. Exactly. Okay, now for pleromic guys, let me help them in this area because even Christians are ignorant of this. <clears throat> pleromic, you do believe the Holy Bible is the inspired, inerrant, infallible Word of God, right? God's true Word and His voice to His church, correct? I just want to make sure because if so, then anything I quote from the Bible, you must accept. Provided I interpret correctly. And I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to illuminate me with wisdom to interpret it correctly. For the glory of Jesus Christ. Are you there, Pleuromic? I'm trying to help you, brother. And I want to take more time than necessary because I want to begin in prayer and begin the topic. Boom, it disappeared on me. Isn't it interesting when you're trying to help someone, all of a sudden they go silent, they don't answer? Yeah, that's okay. I'm not talking about the monastery. I'm talking about you, and I'm talking to you. Okay, I'm talking about you and to you, Pleromic, but you did not answer the question now. Notice you avoided answering the question. Let me try this again. 
Do you believe the Bible is the inspired, inerrant, infallible word of God? It is God's truth, his voice speaking through the church. I like when someone else answers for pleuromic. Okay, pleuromic. I'm going to now show you. No, because Daily Gripe, he blocked you. The Daily Gripe, just listen. And as I answer his questions, Daily Gripe, you'll get an idea of what we're talking about. Now, pleuromic, if you're listening, friend, for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm now going to show you from the Bible that Jesus Christ is in heaven as a glorified man with a glorified human nature and a glorified physical body. He has a physical body of flesh. He has a flesh body that he raised immortal, indestructible, deathless. Are you listening? So that if you believe in the Bible, you must believe that Jesus is truly God, truly human, one eternal person that has two natures, a human nature that he created from the blessed womb of his blessed mother, Mary, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that human nature that he took to himself, that physical body that he took to himself, when it was nailed to the cross and buried, he then raised it on the three third day, raised it on the third day, made his physical body deathless and immortal and indestructible. Okay? Are you ready for the evidence for that? I want to quickly answer for you so you know what to believe as a Christian and we move on. Okay. So do you want the verses pleuromic for me to show you? That's what the Bible teaches about Jesus. He's a deathless man, a man, a human being with a physical body of flesh that is immortal, indestructible, deathless. Okay, good. So guys, bear with me as I give him the verses to demonstrate this. We begin in prayer after that, God willing, and we begin the session. Now, is Protestant here? Rima, no, he didn't. Rima, my sister, you know I love you too, right? Did you hear the part where I said Jesus created his human nature? Jesus created his physical body from the womb of his blessed mother? This is why, guys, I encourage you. If you get involved in chatting in the comment section and talk about issues not re relevant to the topic, you're not going to be listening to me. You're not going to be learning, and you're going to do yourself a disservice and then end up distracting me to repeat a point I made. Right? You were here for what, Pleromic? Not you. I'm talking to Rita, Rima. Because people are... Busy talking about other issues in the comment section. I'm looking at it. And so when you start talking about something, that means you're not focused on the session and what I have to say. And then you're not going to learn. And then you're going to ask me a question I already answered if you're listening. I'm not saying Rima necessarily. So it's not directed to you necessarily. Right? <clears throat> you want me there? Okay, now... Let me show you where the Bible says when Jesus was raised on the third day. On the third day. That resurrection meant that physical body that Jesus had that could grow old, that could grow tired, get tired, fatigue, and be put to death. That physical body he raised, but he changed it. How did he change it? His physical body now becomes deathless. It cannot be destroyed. It cannot die. It's deathless and indestructible. Do you get that point? Did you get that point? So let me explain it so I can give you the verses. Please pay attention. This is part of your faith. This is what you're supposed to believe if you believe the Bible. Okay, focus. The body that Jesus created from the womb of his blessed mother that he took on. Before his death, that human body, he could grow old, get tired, fatigue, need to sleep. That body could decay and die. Okay. When he raised that body on the third day, that body now becomes indestructible, 
immortal, deathless, that body can never die and be destroyed. So that's what we call the glorified body. Do you understand the difference? It's that body he took from his blessed mother that could die and grow old and fatigue that now he transformed and made deathless and indestructible. It's still a body of flesh. The difference is it's deathless. It cannot die, cannot be destroyed, can, cannot grow old. And that's what he'll do to our bodies. That's what he will do to our bodies. Okay? So let me show that to you. Are you ready? Now let's go through the verses proving that. I want to be real quick so we can begin the topic. Are we ready? Are we ready for the proof? Okay, if we're ready, ready means you won't let Satan distract you, you rebuke him in the name of Jesus and focus on the evidence because you need to learn this because when someone asks you, is Jesus a man in heaven with a body? You'll say yes and explain. Let's go to Luke 24, 36 to 43. Luke 24, verses 36 to 43, that first resurrection Sunday where the Lord Jesus appeared alive. Verse 39 is the key. Pay attention. Now, as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace to you. They were terrified and frightened and supposed they had seen a spirit. And when he had said to them, Why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Now watch 39. Pay attention to 39. Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me. Touch my hands and my feet and see, <clears throat> for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. So what do you have now, Jesus? I have a body of flesh and bones. It's flesh, it's bones, it's solid. Touch it. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they still did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, have you any food here? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, verse 43, and he took it and ate in their presence. So catch what Jesus said. I'm now raised from the dead, and I'm in my physical body of flesh and bones. It's a physical body. It's a solid physical body, tangible. Okay? John 20, 24 to 29. <clears throat> No, he's not. He's a follower of Jesus Christ. Muslim monotheists, do not change the subject. Focus, or I'm going to send you to Mecca to smooch the black stone like a good pagan, even though you claim to be a monotheist. Focus and learn. Now Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord. Now notice what Thomas said. <clears throat> so he said to them, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side. I will not believe. Okay. Now pay attention to what Thomas is asking. You're telling me you've seen the Lord. That means he's been raised, right? That means the body that was nailed, beaten to a bloody pulp has now been raised to life. That means if it's that body, the holes in his hands from the nails will still be there. And the piercing from the spear will still be there. The, the marks, the wounds of the crucifixion will still be apparent in that body if he's been raised. So I got to see it and touch it for myself. So now notice what Jesus said. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, peace be to you. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here, put out your finger into my hands. Reach your hand here, put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. <clears throat> 29. Jesus said to him, Thomas, I'm sorry. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Okay, did you guys catch Jesus' physical body being raised to life means that that body that had the holes from the nails in the hands are still there. There are still holes in his hands. And the hole from the spear thrust 
is still there in that body. You can still see the hole. I don't know if it's on the right side, left side. We're not told in the scripture. So the body that Jesus <clears throat> raised, the body that Jesus took to himself, the body that Jesus is attached to as part of his human nature is that physical body that was nailed and buried, but now raised immortal, deathless. But that physical body still has the wounds of the crucifixion as part of his physical body forever and ever. Okay, plural, you so far, are you with me? Pleuromic, do you see that? So you want to make sure Pleuromic is getting it. If you only could answer a little faster, it'd make my life easier, not less stressful. I don't know why it takes some 50 minutes to answer. Pleuromic, earth calling Pleuromic. Okay, you got it right. Answer a little faster. Acts 2, 29 to 33. Acts 2, 29 to 33. Yeah, he answered after I said that. Brat and Shifa. Acts 2, 29 to 33. Yeah, it's off topic, Rima. Figure it out. It's not hard to figure out your own the answer to your own question. Acts 2, 29 to 33. Men and brethren... Let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David. David, the patriarch, when Peter said this, as he's filled with the Holy Spirit, Pentecost, the Holy Spirit has filled him to preach boldly, Jesus Christ crucified and risen. David had been dead for a thousand years. The patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Now watch what he says. David, a prophet, receiving revelation from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit revealed to David that the Messiah would die and be raised, immortal. <clears throat> Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, meaning a physical descendant, a descendant from his physical lineage, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne, which is part of our discussion tonight. This passage segues into my talk tonight on Hebrews 1.5. Some places it's night, some places it's still day, okay? The fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would <clears throat> raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing, David was allowed by the Holy Spirit to see beforehand, to see in advance. The Holy Spirit showed David the future. And what did the Holy Spirit show David? He showed David, 31, right, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ. He saw and was then able to write and speak about the resurrection of Christ. <clears throat> that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. The Holy Spirit revealed to David that Jesus' flesh body would not corrupt. Why would it not corrupt? Because 32. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses, and then 33. We are all witnesses, 33. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. Now, did you catch what Peter said about <clears throat> David? David, a thousand years earlier, received revelation from the Holy Spirit who allowed David to see, not just to hear, See the future. He saw Christ being raised in his flesh body, which is how God prevented Jesus' flesh body from corrupting because he raised his flesh body on the third day, and in that flesh body, Jesus ascended to God's right hand. Did you catch it before I move on? Before I move on, Pleuromic. Okay, now Pleuromic, understand what you just read. The flesh that Jesus took from his blessed mother that he died in, 
did not corrupt and decay like dead bodies do. Dead bodies de decay and deteriorate. His didn't. Why? Because God raised that flesh afresh on the third day, made it immortal and deathless. And Jesus is in that deathless, immortal flesh body, body of flesh and bone in heaven. And he's going to return in that immortal, deathless body of flesh and bone. That's what the Bible teaches. That means he's still human. He's still a man because he has a flesh body because he's man. Because as God, God is bodiless. God is spirit and therefore bodiless and shapeless. But because Jesus is man, he has a physical body, a physical shape that he's attached to, attached himself to forever. And therefore he'll forever be a man. Now, Acts 17, 30 to 31. We're almost done. So, folks, make sure you get this. Jesus is God, man, fully divine, fully human, truly God, truly human. And as a man, he has a physical body, a body of flesh and bone that he's now made immortal, indestructible, and deathless. That's what the Bible teaches. And when he comes to judge the world, he does so as a man. Here, Acts 17, 30 to 31. Acts 17, 30 to 31. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day <clears throat> on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man. See, God has appointed a man to judge the world of humans. A human being will judge other human beings, and there's wisdom behind it, which God willing, I'll unpack in a future session. Whom he has ordained, he has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. So the man that will judge the world of human beings is the man that God raised from the dead. That's Jesus. So Jesus will return as a human being, as a man to judge human beings. That means right now in heaven, he's a man. He's a human being. But he's a deathless human being, a human that cannot die. Romans 6, <clears throat> 8 to 10. Romans 6, 8 to 10. Let's include verse 7 as well. Romans 6, 8 to 10, but we'll include verse 7. Haterwood's in the house. Learn some sound theology. Sound theology. Send me your thousand viewers that you put to sleep and torture so they can learn sound theology. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, guys, pay attention. Focus by the power of the Holy Spirit. Focus by the grace of Jesus Christ. Notice what Paul says about Jesus. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Why? Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. You got it? Romans 6, verse 9. Deanna, who told you that if you don't die, you don't eat? Romans 6, verse 9. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. He is deathless by nature, even as a man. You guys catch it? Don't be distracted. Focus, guys, please. I want you to learn your theology, your what your Bible teaches. You guys caught it there? So who now mediates for us in heaven? Who now mediates before God on our behalf in heaven? Who is doing it now in heaven? 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. Not just Jesus, no. No, no, not just Jesus. Nope, you guys don't get it. No, no, Jonathan got it. Jonathan is the only one who got it. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. See, all you guys failed royally except Jonathan, Simon, and Britit Mshicha. Britit Mshicha. The man, Christ Jesus. Let me, let's post it again. First Timothy 2, verse 5. 
First Timothy 2, verse 5. Not just Jesus, the man that is Christ Jesus. First Timothy 2, verse 5, one more time. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. You got it? Hebrews 7, 16. What kind of man is he? What kind of man is he? Hebrews 7, verse 16. Flamboyant Peng. If I have to explain to you what the difference is, you know, you and me, you're going to have serious problems, and you're going to be on, on my dislike list because you have people, they'll tell you Jesus mediates, but that he's not a man. He's a spirit creature. Do I need to explain it to you? Are you insulting me that I have to explain it to you? Hebrews 7, verse 16. Who has come, not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. An endless life. Jesus' human life never ends. Did you catch it? An endless life. Hebrews 7, 23 to 25, specifically 24 and 25. Hebrews 7, 23 to 25. Hebrews 7, 23 to 25. Also, there are many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. So they had to be replaced. When one priest died, another had to replace him. But he, Jesus, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. So he's not like these priests that needs to be replaced. Why? He continues forever and can never be replaced. Verse 25. Therefore, he is also able to save <clears throat> to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives, always lives to make intercession for, for them. So unlike the priests on earth who need to be replaced because they die, one priest comes, dies, replaced by another priest who dies, and this priest never dies. His life is endless. He lives forever and therefore will be an eternal priest. You guys got it? Final proof that he's still a man. In heaven, in glory, as he reigns in heaven, as king of kings, lord of lords, in heaven, re revealing the revelation to John from heaven. What did Jesus say to John? Revelation 22, 16. Revelation 22, verse 16. No, not a hypocritic union. Jesus is not a hypocrite, blue bubbletron. Maybe you'll be a permanent hypocrite, but not him. Revelation 22, verse 16. Read with me. Read this, please. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am, not I was. I am, not I was. I am right now, John, in heaven as I speak to you. I am right now the root and offspring of David, the bright morning star. Now, if you go with the traditional dating that John wrote the Revelation around 90 AD, <clears throat> 90 AD, that's 60 years after his resurrection. 60 years after his resurrection, Jesus in heaven says to John, watch here, I am right now the offspring of David. Now, folks, how can Jesus still be David's son, David's physical descendant, David's physical offspring, still, that now that he's in heaven, if he's not still human? How can Jesus, in glory, still say, I am still the physical offspring of David if he's not physically human? What's the answer? So what are you supposed to believe? What are you supposed to believe? Jesus is God that became man. And by virtue of the resurrection, he still remains a man with a physical body, a body of flesh and bone, what we call a spiritual body, not because it's not physical, but because it's under the power and dominion of the spirit and therefore indestructible and immortal, deathless. 
And because of that, that guarantees that we who are in Jesus Christ, we who are born of the Spirit, who belong to Jesus, these decrepit bodies of sin that we wrestle with, that we succumb to, sinful passions and imperfections, these bodies will be transformed to be like his physical body. So these bodies will be free of all sin and death and decay. That's what his resurrection guarantees for our bodies. And where am I getting that from? Philippians 3, verses 20 to 21. Philippians 3, 20 to 21. Watch here. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, our bodies that are decrepit, decaying, dying, that suffer pain and disease, that struggle with sin, sinful desires and passions that we often succumb to, to our shame, and may the Lord Jesus have mercy on us and forgive us not to justify falling into our sinful passions, but overcome them. This lowly body, he will transform, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. So notice three things from this passage. Three things from verse 21. Number one, Jesus is almighty. He's all powerful. How do we know? Because Paul says it is his power, his working, that not only enables him to change our bodies, all of our bodies, but allows him to bring everything under subjection to him. He must be all-powerful to be able to subject everything to him and to transform multitudes of human bodies to become indestructible, immortal, deathless. Number one. Okay. Number two. Jesus has a glorious body in heaven. Jesus has a physical body that is glorious and immortal. And number three, we who are redeemed belong to Christ. Our bodies too will be transformed, made immortal and deathless. So those who are dead in Christ, they'll return to bodies that he will resurrect and make immortal and deathless. And if we are alive, when Christ comes down, then in a twinkling of an eye, these bodies that are prone to death and disease and sin will be changed to be deathless and sinless and immortal by his power. Did you see the three facts that you, you learned from Philippians 3.21? The three facts you just learned from Philippians 3.21? Jesus is the almighty son. He is a glorified man with a glorious body of flesh, and he will transform our bodies to become glorious like his. Philippians 3.21. Is that clear? That was to answer this question. Now we can pray and begin the session. So Pleromic, you now know what you're supposed to believe about Jesus' body the nature of his body, and what will happen to our bodies, even the bodies of those who died in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Send Christian Finland back to Finland. He needs to get out of here. I don't want you back in my, my sessions anymore, Christian Finland. Stay in Finland. Don't come back here. Okay? Don't come back here. Cadence, why are you on hiding him? Cadence, should I hide you too? Get him out of here. For you to ask this question, you shouldn't be in these sessions. Go back to kindergarten. Okay. All right. It's okay, Candace. Christos and Esti may be an accident, but he's loved of Jesus. My doctrine of salvation is Nanya, Alexander. You know what Nanya is? It's a new doctrine that I came up with means none of your business. So, Alexander, let me answer your question. My doctrine is nanya. Okay? It's none of your business. You want to come here, listen, and learn? Fine. You want to come ask questions? Bye-bye. 
Oh, bye, 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 bye. Right? Okay. Guys, I'm going to get something to drink and we're going to begin. So can you pray now? Pray for me. That the spirit fills the session and fills me, crucifies our flesh, destroys our flesh, fills us with power to overcome the flesh and to forgive us when we fail like I do in Jesus' name. Because I'm going to get something to drink for my throat. So, what? Sorry, I just blew your ears. Okay. I pray for the connection. I'm just going to get water. I'll be right back. And I get something to drink. Bye, bye. Oh, bye, 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 bye. Let me sing. Keep entertained. No, no, La 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 Blaspheme the trying God and his word if you justify abortion, which is murder. Guaranteed ban. Now, the mods have full authority to block people at their own discretion because I trust my mods. <clears throat> I know they love Jesus. Right? Even though some of the mods can be a pain in my side, I still love them anyway. We won't mention any names. Which mods are like a pain in my side? We won't mention any names. names. Christos and Esti. No, I'm just kidding. He's a good brother. He's a good brother. I'm just playing with him. Let me just drink and we're going to pray <clears throat> because my throat needs to be cleared up. <clears throat> me, 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 me. Figaro. <clears throat> okay, let's begin. Father, we love you. <clears throat> Son of God, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. <clears throat> Holy Spirit, I need you, not just to teach. I need you to live the victorious Christian life. <clears throat> Wash us in the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus. Help us to overcome and crucify our flesh, not to be hypocrites, especially me. Save me from my hypocrisy. Holy Spirit, help me to be self-disciplined and self-controlled, to live in the victory of the cross of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Fill my throat with life, Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Clear out my throat, my lungs, and my chest to use my voice to glorify Jesus Christ, your eternal companion, the eternal Son of the Father. Anoint my words to be clear and accurate and passionate, filled with love for the Holy Spirit, for the Lord Jesus, for the Father. Please, Holy Spirit, filled with love for you, for the Son, for the Father. <clears throat> Bless them, Holy Spirit, to understand the things I say as you enable me to recall the passages and interpret them correctly. Save me from error and illuminate us, Holy Spirit. Remove the veil from our eyes to find the depth of Scripture, to plunge the depth of Scripture, the meat of Scripture, and to eat the words that you inspired. Live them out for the glory of Jesus. Destroy distractions of Satan. Destroy distractions of the sons of Satan. <clears throat> Constrain us and control us for the glory of Jesus and help us to be spiritually disciplined. Engage in intense spiritual exercises, praying and worshiping and singing praises and fasting and studying the word and then living it out by our deeds, loving our neighbors. Help us in those areas, Holy Spirit. Help me to be a doer of your word for the glory of Jesus. May he increase in us. May we decrease and we disappear and Jesus shine perfectly through us. Wash us in the blood of the Lamb. Wash our loved ones in the blood of the Lamb. Wash my daughters in the blood of the Lamb. Holy Spirit, sanctify us for the glory of Jesus. We depend on you. We trust in you. We love you. We hope in you, Holy Spirit, the almighty, eternal Spirit of the Father and the Son, the teacher sent from Jesus to teach us. Have your way and bless this session for the glory of Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. We love you, beloved Son of God. We love you, Father the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and help me to be a doer and save me from my flesh. Please, Father, 
for the glory of Jesus. Save them, bless them, sanctify them for the glory of your son. Please, Father, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. Y'all go fall in spirit. <clears throat> Side note. <clears throat> Side note. I'm going to be compiling some citations showing the early practice of doing the sign of the cross. <clears throat> One of the oldest references that we have is from the Odes of Solomon, the Odes of Solomon. And scholars have variously dated the Odes of Solomon to the latter part of the first century. Some say it's no later than 100 AD. <clears throat> Some would place it in the second and third centuries. But I need to do this because for a long time, I struggle with doing the sign of the cross because among many Protestant circles, not all, and again, Alan and others can correct me if I'm wrong. <clears throat> if I'm not mistaken, Lutherans and Episcopalians do the sign of the cross. And there is ancient precedence, writings in early church documents that show that the Christians we're in the habit of doing the sign of the cross in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and so now I want to go back to the roots of my parents and my ancestors. In the Assyrian Church of the East, they do the sign of the cross. The Orthodox do the sign of the cross. <clears throat> the Roman Catholics do the sign of the cross. Now, they don't all do it the same way, but they do the sign of the cross. So again, if I'm not mistaken, Episcopalians do the sign of the cross. <clears throat> Lutherans do the sign of the cross. Now, if the evidence from the oaths <clears throat> is clear that it is a late first century witness, we have at least an extent written source showing you this is an ancient practice that goes within the first generation or the first two generations of the apostles. So Protestants hesitate to do the sign of the cross because they think that others will say, oh, you're a Catholic, not realizing there are Protestants who do the sign of the cross. Episcopalians, Lutherans, not realizing that the Assyrian church does the sign of the cross and the Orthodox. Now, people are going to think that I'm getting to be Catholic or I'm getting to be Orthodox or Assyrian church. No, I'm trying to be as faithful to Scripture as possible. And I just want to be <clears throat> as God-honoring as possible. And I want the Holy Spirit to guide me into all truth for the glory of Jesus. And I'm at the point now, doing the sign of the cross is an ancient practice that is not condemned in Scripture and that doesn't go against Scripture. So expect me to do something on this. I'm going to write on this to present the evidence. Lest people say, see, I knew it. I knew it. The man is a Catholic plant. He's been sent by the Jesuits. I am Shimon. See, I knew it. There were Jesuits behind him, supporting him to infiltrate, to bring them back to Mother Church. Hey! <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. I want to be a biblicist. As the Lord knows my heart better than I do, I'm being as faithful, honest to the truth, to the best of my ability, right? Trusting the Holy Spirit is my God who loves me, and I pray I love him and obey him, he'll guide me into all truth. But it is. I've heard people say, See, I knew it, Sam. I knew it. You're working for the black pope, the Jesuit, Ignatius of Loyola. <laughs> they sent you early on to portray. You trying to bring us to Mother Church. That's what you doing, sucker. I think someone just recently told me that too, right? Someone just said, a Baptist said to them, I don't know if they were joking, it was in jest. A Baptist said to them that Sam is a Catholic plant. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He and his limbship. Folks, one thing I'm going to ask you and I'm going to repeat <clears throat> like a broken record. <clears throat> I want you from the depth of your being and from the depth of your heart Meet it from your heart. Cry out to the Holy Spirit. Ask the Holy Spirit to protect you, to teach you, to seal you, to perfect you, to fall more in love with Jesus, and to guide you all truth and save you from falsehood. Once you entrust yourself to the Holy Spirit, 
you're in perfect arms because the arms of the Holy Spirit are almighty arms to save you and love you and preserve you. Entrust yourself to the Holy Spirit. And that's what I say. Holy Spirit, my life is yours. Possess me and have your way with me and save me from my flesh. And trust him. Don't trust any human teacher or guide. And I'm letting you know, don't trust me. Don't make me more than I am. Take what I have to say. Go back and study it. Ask the Spirit to show you where I'm wrong. And if I'm wrong, I'm asking the Holy Spirit to show me where I'm wrong and repent of it. Trust the Holy Spirit. I'm going to tell you again. <clears throat> trust the Holy Spirit. Seek him. Cry out to him. Beg him. And you don't need to beg him. The Holy Spirit is in love with you. He was sent by Jesus who is in love with you to seal you and guide you and perfect you and teach you and preserve you. So seek the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, please, my life is yours for the glory of Jesus. You are my teacher. I love you. Be my companion forever and trust him and he'll guide you. He'll guide you to the right teachers. He'll guide you to the right information. He'll guide you to the right conclusions. It may take a while. He doesn't do it overnight, right? Look at me. How many years did it take me to discover things or to accept things or acknowledge things that for a long time I didn't want to be true? So it doesn't mean he's going to do it overnight. It means he will do it in his timing, by his grace, as you walk with him on this journey to salvation. No, you don't, <clears throat> low curry. Low curry arts, there's nothing in the Bible that condemns doing the sign of the cross. That's my point. Nothing that says don't do it, right? But because of evangelical Christianity and the influence, a lot of people are afraid or embarrassed to do it, right? Because they think, oh, if I do it, then maybe he's going to think I'm a Catholic. And then I'm going to have some shows, maybe divine lines attacking me. You know what I'm saying? All right, anyway. With that said, let's begin. Are we ready? Are we ready for that? Uh, I'll give you an example of what I mean. Just let me illustrate it. The other day, Lord bless Alan Ruhl, Saturday night, he invited me to do a pre-recorded session on Paul and Islam. Did you guys watch it, by the way? It's on his YouTube channel. He recorded it. He uploaded it. Paul and Islam. Did you go to his channel, Alan Ruhl? He's here, one of my mods. Subscribe to his channel. Go watch it. Paul in Islam, as I was praying, he did the sign of the cross. I hesitated, but then I did it with him. I said, yeah, name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you know why I hesitated? May the Lord save me from all fear and shame. <clears throat> I hesitated because I already know people are watching me to try to condemn me and accuse me of either compromising or becoming a communicable and or perverting the gospel. Right? So post the link, Alan, for everyone. He did. Thank you. It's right there. Watch it. Like it. Pass it on. <clears throat> exactly, Ariel. I don't want to be a crowd pleaser, and I don't want to be unnecessarily offensive. So pray for my journey. Okay, now with that said, let's begin Hebrews 1.5. <clears throat> exactly, Lisa. Yeah. When someone asks you, what do you believe about salvation? You know they're here to drill you, right, Lisa? It's a loaded question. When someone comes to my channel and asks me, what do you believe of salvation? That means they're sitting on the judgment seat to judge whether I'm a Christian or not. Say, I'm not stupid. Remember, I wasn't born yesterday. I was born the day before. So I was born two days ago, not yesterday. So I'm nobody's fool. <clears throat> so I knew when he asked me the question, he wants to sit on the judgment seat. Oh, really? That's what you believe about salvation? Then I'm out of here, heretic. Okay, now. Exactly, Ariel. Don't turn me into anti-Catholic, Ariel. You're getting close. No, I'm kidding. With that said, <clears throat> Hebrews 1.5. Let's make a thorough exposition of Hebrews 1, verse 5. Hebrews 1, verse 5. Let's look at it. <clears throat> and after this, God willing, I'm going live with Al Fadi, my favorite heretic in the world. I'm going to be going live for his live stream. Sira International. Okay, Hebrews 1.5. For to which of the angels <clears throat> did he ever say, you are my son, today I've begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. 
May the Lord Jesus anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to your ears. And if you wonder why I ask that, when I hear my voice, I cringe. I cannot stand my voice. As long as you're okay with it, God bless you. Now, <clears throat> Saturday, I broke this down real, uh, real briefly. This is a passage that's misquoted to show that Jesus was begotten by the Father in the sense that God brought Jesus into being. God brought Jesus into existence. Jesus received his life from the Father. That's how this is misquoted. If you remember my talk on Saturday, I demonstrated Hebrews 1, verse 5. Pay attention. <clears throat> Hebrews 1, verse 5 has nothing to do with the divine nature of Jesus. Let me repeat. Hebrews 1, verse 5 has nothing to do with the divine nature of Jesus. It's not referring to Jesus' eternal relationship to the Father. It has nothing to do with that. It has nothing to do with his incarnation, that he was conceived to and born from his blessed mother to be a human being, and that act of conception and birth from his virgin mother by the power of the Holy Spirit is when God begot him as his son. Nothing to do with the incarnation. As I demonstrated, and as we're going to see again, so I can fully unpack the meat of this by the power of the Holy Spirit, it has to do with Jesus being crowned the Messianic King, the anointed King from the line of David. It is what we call a coronation psalm or a coronation coronation. <clears throat> Yeah, the psalm that's quoted, Psalm 2, 7, and then 2 Samuel 7, 14, it has to do with the coronation of the king. The day in which God's appointed king is crowned to begin his reign as God's ruler. Let me repeat. It's referring to Jesus' coronation. The day in which he begins ruling as a son of David, as an heir of David, as David's representative. Everyone with me? Because we're going to relook at some of the passages and build on it. Because the two citations that Hebrews 1.5 is quoting from refer to the anointed king of Israel being appointed to sit on God's throne on earth. And where was God's throne on earth? In Jerusalem to begin ruling over Israel as God's <clears throat> vice regent, so to speak, right? As his earthly representative, where he takes the throne of God on earth, God's earthly throne, and sits on God's earthly throne on God's behalf over God's people. It's referring to the day the kings begin ruling as king, right? Just want to make sure. <clears throat> Everyone with me there? If you got it, I can now build on this. Just want to make sure you're getting it because I covered much of this Saturday. Lord willing, I'm going to go over it again because we're creatures of repetition. We need to hear things repetitively until it becomes second nature by the grace of God's spirit. Now, the two passages that Hebrews 1.5 Hebrews 1, is referring to. The two passages that Hebrews 1, 5 cites from demonstrate what I just said. This is referring to the day in which God's appointed king begins ruling over God's people on God's behalf. Let's go to Psalm 2, verses 6 to 7. I don't know what yoso ye means. I have no idea what you mean by two. You don't get it or you're just playing games? I have no idea. Psalm 2, verses 6 to 7. <clears throat> this is where Hebrews 1.5 is quoting from. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. Notice, I placed my king in Zion, which is a hill in Jerusalem. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Make the connection. When God says to the king, today I have begotten you, 
What day is God referring to in the context? It's right there in verse 6. What's the day? What's the day? Verse 6 tells you, right? Flamboyant peg. If you show me Calvary there, I'll give you a million bucks. If you don't, I'm going to block you because I'm, I'm getting tired. Psalm 2, verse 6. I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. This is the day you've become my son. The day in which you begin ruling is the day in which I begot you to be my son. Today, the day you begin your rule. Today is the day you start ruling on my behalf. And this is the day you become my son. Because what does a good son do? Carry in the footsteps of his father. Carries out the work of his father. And represents his father. And that's what the king of Israel is supposed to do. The king of Israel is supposed to carry out the rule of God, represent God's rule on earth, and in that sense, reflect God in the way God rules as king, and therefore is God's son in that sense. A son, biblically speaking, represents his father and carries on the work of his father. So the king of Israel represents Yahweh as king and is supposed to reflect Yahweh's rule on earth. In other words... The way Yahweh rules in heaven is the way the king is supposed to rule on earth. And since Yahweh, or if you want to say Jehovah, is a righteous king whose rule is righteous and just and perfect, the earthly king has to reflect those qualities of God's kingship. So in that sense, he's called to be God's son because a son bears the image of his father and reflects the image of his father. You get it before I move on? <clears throat> you understand what a son is supposed to do? A son is supposed to represent his father, carry on the work of his father, is the image of his father, so he's supposed to bear resemblance to his father. He's supposed to res resemble his father. So the king of Israel is called God's son because he's supposed to resemble the rule of God in heaven on earth. You want me there? So do you see why he says, today I've begotten you? This is the day that you begin ruling as my representative, and this is the day that I beget you to reflect my kingship, my sovereignty, and my character. You see? So the term that I use to describe this type of sonship, right, is royal sonship. God's royal son. I didn't know what term to come up with, so I just came up with this term. I may copyright it. What do I mean by God's royal son? Meaning, the king of Israel, begotten by God to be his son, on the day in which he takes the throne to reflect God's throne on earth and to bear <clears throat> resemblance to the way God rules over creation. A son resembles his father. A son bears the resemblance of his father. A son is supposed to carry on the work of his father. And therefore, the king of Israel is God's son in the sense that he's supposed to resemble the way God rules as king. And reflect God's characteristics as he rules on earth on God's behalf. Clear? Is that clear before I move on? Avinash, do you mind me? I block you now or later. When do you want me to block you? Now or later, Avinash? I want to block you now. Should I wait till later to block you? Okay. Thank you for the super chats. God bless you. Now, the second citation, the second citation in Hebrews 1.5, where it says, I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me, right? 
That comes from 2 Samuel 7, 14 and 1 Chronicles 17, verse 13. But let's go to 1 Chronicles to see. 1 Chronicles 17, verses 10 to 14. And again, it has to do with the king of Israel, the heir of David's throne. The throne that God gave to David on earth, which is God's earthly throne. And I'll repeat the same point over and over again. Read with me. <clears throat> Here it is. Verse 13 is the key. Since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, <clears throat> also I will subdue all your enemies. Furthermore, I tell you that the Lord Jehovah will build you a house. And it shall be when your days are fulfilled, when you most, must go to be with your fathers, that I will set up your seed, physical seed, after you, who will be of your sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build me a house, right? And I will establish his throne forever. Notice verse 13, because that's what Hebrews 1.5 is citing. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. And I will not take my mercy away from him as I took it from him who was before you. And I will establish him in my house and in my kingdom forever. And his throne shall be established forever. This is the second passage. Hebrews 1, 5 is citing. First Chronicles 17, 13. Also found in 2 Samuel 7, verse 14. Did you notice again it has to do with kingship, royalty, rulership? I'm going to take your physical seed, your physical son, making, making him my king, and I will be a father to him, and he'll be a son to me, and he will sit on the throne, and I'll establish his kingdom. Did you catch it again? It has nothing to do with bringing someone into being from non-being, bringing someone into existence from non-existence, because these kings already existed before they became God's sons ruling on his throne. Right? Before I move on, I don't know what John 5.30 has to do with it, but I think I get where you're going with this. That Jesus resembles his father perfectly and does only what his father does. Right? <clears throat> I'm going to unpack this. I'm going to repeat myself more than once, but be bear with me. David was already existing and alive before he took the throne and became God's son. Solomon was already existing and alive before he took the throne and became God's son. Did you catch it? So the begetting here is not begetting someone who didn't exist at all, bringing him into existence. It's giving birth to those who already existed. So this, again, demonstrates Jesus can be the eternally begotten son and always existing. To beget doesn't mean to bring someone into being. You can beget someone who already exists. You get my point? You see what I'm doing here? So how can Jesus be the only begotten son and eternally exist? Because who told you that if Jesus is begotten, he hasn't always existed? Where'd you get that from? That's not a biblical argument. Because David and Solomon already existed. What's good? Post John 5.30 one more time. And I will send you to Hawaii so you can be under a coconut tree and celebrate John 5.30 as you sip on coconut milk. Okay? You with me there? David and Solomon were already alive, were already conscious, already had existence before God begot them. When they became king, representing God on earth. How do I know it's Solomon? Let's go to 1 Chronicles 22, verses 7 to 10. 1 Chronicles 22, verses 7 to 10. Thank you, Daily Gripe. Thank you, all the super chatters. God bless you tremendously. 1 Chronicles 22, verses 7 to 10. Okay. How do I know it's taught about Solomon? 1 Chronicles 22, verses 7 to 10. Watch here. Anti-Trinitarians wait the Trinity, Pedro. Google, be free in the Holy Spirit to do the sign of the cross and do not let anyone condemn you. Because not just Roman Catholics. Orthodox do it. Syrian Church of the East does it. Coptics do it. As well as Episcopalians and Lutherans. Feel free in the Spirit to worship God the way the Holy Spirit wants you to worship. 
First Chronicles 22, 7 to 10. Read with me. <clears throat> and, and the word of the Lord, and the word of the Lord came to me saying, guys, read, please. First Chronicles 22, verses 7 to 10. And the word of the Lord, and David said to Solomon, where was I reading? Oh, I skipped verse 8. Sorry. First Chronicles 22, 7 to 10. Read with me. And David said to Solomon, he's talking to Solomon, and David said to Solomon, my son, as for me, it was in my mind to build a house to the name of the Lord, Jehovah my God. <clears throat> but the word of the Lord came to me saying, you have shed much blood and have made great wars. You've killed too many people. You are too violent. Therefore, you cannot build me a house because my house represents peace, rest, wholeness, unity. You represent war and unnecessary bloodshed. You've killed too many people, David. Disqualified. You cannot build me a house. You've shed much blood and have made great wars. You shall not build a house for my name because you have shed much blood on the earth in my sight. Behold, a son shall be born to you who shall be a man of rest. And I will give him rest from all his enemies all around. His name shall be Solomon. See, even God names him. Solomon, now notice verse 10, for I will give him, pay attention, peace and quietness to Israel in his days. He shall build a house for my name, and he shall be my son, and I will be his father, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. Any doubt that this is referring to Solomon? God bless you, Ricardo. Lord bless you all. Thank you so much for your support. Any doubt? Any doubt this is referring to Solomon? Any doubt? When does Solomon become God's son? And when does God become his father? When he takes the throne from David on earth and builds God a house. Sort of truth. Help me, please. He says, why Solomon? If he had chosen Hezekiah, he would have then told me, why Hezekiah? But if you chose <clears throat> Absalom, he would have said, why Absalom? If you, if you chose Amna, Amman, he'd ask me, why Amman? What do I do with these people? Okay. For those of you paying attention and not asking me silly, irrelevant questions, okay, let's focus here. Do you see it's Solomon? Do you see it's talking about Solomon? Okay. When does Solomon become God's son and God becomes his father? When he takes the throne from David, representing God on earth. First Chronicles 28, verses 4 to 7. First Chronicles 28, verses 4 to 7. Okay. First Chronicles 28, verses 4 to 7. However, the Lord God of Israel, David speaking, the Lord God of Israel chose me above all the house of my father, to be king over Israel forever. For he has chosen Judah to be the ruler. And I'm the house of Judah, the house of my father. And among the sons of my father, he was pleased with me to make me king over all Israel. Now watch verse 5. And of all my sons, <clears throat> for God, the Lord Jehovah, has given me many sons. He has chosen my son Solomon. Does that satisfy your question, sort of truth? God is free to choose whom he wants. Of all the tribes, he chose Judah to be the line of kings. From all the clans of Judah, he chose Jesse. From all the sons of Jesse, he chose David. From all God's freedom in choosing whom he wants. My question is, why did he choose you for salvation? You see? Do you like that question? Wait, why did you choose him for salvation? Oh, because you love him and desire salvation. Oh, oh, oh. But see, that's the kind of question he asked me. Why did you choose Solomon? All right, now. 
Let me read five again. Of all my sons, for Lord Jehovah has given me many sons, he has chosen my son Solomon to sit on the throne of whose kingdom? The kingdom of the Lord over Israel. God said, I am pleased to have Solomon sit on my throne on earth over Israel. Now notice six. Now he said to me, it is your son Solomon who shall build my house and my courts, for I have chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father. Okay, now verse 7. Moreover, I will establish his kingdom forever, if he is steadfast to observe my commandments and my judgments as it is this day. All right, what more proof do you need? Solomon is the son of God who takes the throne from David, to represent God's rule on earth over God's people Israel. So God at this time had two thrones. God at this time had two thrones. In heaven, and he alone sits on the throne of heaven, no one else, and a throne on earth. The throne on earth was in Jerusalem, and that throne he gave to David and his sons. You catch it now? First Chronicles 29, 23. Mods, if you find people you're distracting because they don't want to pay attention or they just want to play games, you have my authority to just get rid of them because they're distracting everyone else. First Chronicles 29, 23. Then Solomon sat on the throne of the Lord Jehovah as king instead of David his father, and prospered, and all Israel obeyed him. One more time. Let's post it one more time. Bozak, do you think you're saved or you're damned? Why are you asking me an irrelevant question? Guys, can I just digress for a moment? People get upset when I do this. Why do you guys ask me, and I have to be honest, if you're going to get offended with me, forgive me. Why do you ask, ask me some of the stupidest questions that have nothing to do with the topic? If Saul is saved or damned, what has it got to do with Solomon and the throne and how Jesus fulfills it? Can you help me understand the way you guys think? I really want to understand. I want to understand how you guys think. Blatino has got to go, right? Blatino has got to go. Come on. Well, help me understand. Remember, I'm stupid, right? David would just call me Rain Man. Bozak, let me enter your mind. I want to think like you. What does the issue of Saul got to do with this topic? Put me in your mindset, in your shoes, because I want to think why you think this way. Either I'm demented or you're demented or we're both demented. I'm demented or you're demented or we're both demented. What does the issue of Saul, his salvation, have to do with Solomon? Let me repeat it again. What does the issue of Saul and his salvation have to do with Solomon? Okay. Let's come back. First Chronicles 29, 23. Then Solomon sat on the throne of the Lord as king instead of David his father. So he took the throne from David. The throne given to David, Solomon inherits, inherits, right? And prospered, and all Israel obeyed him. Okay. Yeah, Syrian, maybe I should beat your mother for giving birth to a dog like you, Syrian. Can I beat your mother, silly? Or maybe your dad did it. Just kidding, Christians. Just saying. Okay. Now, let's go to 2 Chronicles 9, verse 8. 2 Chronicles 9, verse 8. <clears throat> Have you noticed when it's a very important topic and we're going to go into meat and learn something amazing, Satan and his children come out without, they don't stop. And then he uses even gullible Christians to distract. Pay attention. Notice what's happening now. Second Chronicles 9 verse 8. Blessed be the Lord your God. This is the Queen of Sheba talking to Solomon. Blessed be the Lord your God who delighted in you, in you Solomon, setting you on his throne. Whose throne? God's throne. To be king for the Lord your God, because your God has loved Israel to establish them forever. Therefore, he made you king over them to do justice and righteousness. Okay, now, 
Did you guys catch it? The throne is given to David to rule on earth, God's earthly throne. David's throne is inherited by his physical sons whom God appoints to be his successors. Who's the first successor of David? Solomon. Notice that each of the kings that sit on God's throne are said to be the son of God. Said to be the son of God. Whoever takes the throne in Zion, in Jerusalem, to rule over God's people, God's earthly throne on earth, God says, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. This is the day I begot you to be my son. What's that day? The day you take the throne to rule as king, representing me on earth. Why does God beget them to be his sons? Because a son is supposed to resemble his father. As Holy Spirit strengthens my voice and loosens my tongue to bless you. A son is supposed to resemble his father and carry on the work of his father. So David, you are my king on earth, on my earthly throne. That means your responsibility is to resemble my rule in heaven. The way I rule in heaven is the way you rule on earth. This is part of our Lord's prayer, guys. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Are you catching it now? You catching it now? You, the king of Israel, are to manifest my kingdom in heaven on earth. The way I rule in heaven is the way you rule on earth. So I beget you to be my son, meaning as my son, you are called to resemble me in the way I rule and in my characteristics. My rule is perfect. Your rule has to be perfect. My rule is just. Yours is just. Impartial, impartial. Holy, holy. You get it now, right? No, pleuromic. Pleuromic, you know that's a masonry statement, right? I don't know what's wrong with you if you're demonized. As above, so below, that's the Masonic slogan. Why are you mixing in Gnostic, Satanic, Masonic slogans with Christianity? What is wrong with you? A lot of people don't know what you just did. That's a Masonic slogan, dude. As above, so below. That is Illuminati stuff. It's not he doesn't know. The dude keeps reading mystical literature, Gnostic literature. What is wrong with you, man? Are you in, in bed fellowship with Satan? Yeah, Ryan, anytime you hear the slogan, as above, so below, that is a Masonic code word. That is a Masonic slogan. It's like, do what thou wilt. That is the saying of Aleister Crowley, the great beast, who said, my will, not your will be done. Do what thou wilt in opposition to God. These are satanic, Masonic slogans. Yeah. As above, so below. I mean, dude, what is wrong with you, man? Earlier he was quoting the Gnostic Gospel of Philip. A Gnostic book he was quoting to Daily Gripe. Yeah. As above, so below. That's masonry, man. That's masonry. Yeah, and earlier, Daily Gripe can tell you. Even Daily Gripe got, got on him. Why are you quoting Gnostic sources? Right, Daily Gripe? You're here. Guys, please. Jesus and Belial never mix. Christ has no fellowship with Belial. Don't take satanic slogans, satanic statements, and sandwich them with Christianity. As above, so below, utter blasphemy. Okay, let's focus now. Tell me Satan's not upset. May the blood of Jesus Christ wash us 
the blood of Jesus Christ, shield us from Satan and the fire of the Holy Spirit, burn and destroy all satanic influences. Holy Spirit, rebuke the evil one in Jesus' name. Okay? Look at all the distractions, guys. That means God is being glorified by the power of the Holy Spirit. So what is the point of the kingship given to David? As I rule in heaven, so your rule must be on earth. The Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, amen, in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, brother. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done as it is in heaven. That's what David and Solomon were supposed to do. They were supposed to manifest God's rule in heaven on the earth. So what does it mean, you are my son? A son resembles his father. A son carries on the work of his father if he's a faithful son. So what he's saying to the kings is, I beget you as sons to resemble me and carry on my work on earth as you implement my rule on earth, on my earthly throne, the way it's implemented in heaven. You want me there? You understand why it says, I have begotten you. You are my son. I've begotten you. You now take the throne, David. You now take the throne, Solomon. You now take the throne, Hezekiah. This is the day I beget you spiritually, not sexually. God is not a sexual being. He's a spiritual being. I beget you to be my sons because now you have the responsibility as a good son to resemble your father and to carry on my work on earth. If you fail, then you'll be disciplined. Everyone got it? Before I move on? Pay attention. Don't let Satan distract you. You got it now, right? So Hebrews 1.5 has nothing to do with Jesus' eternal relationship to the Father. Hebrews 1.5 has nothing to do with Jesus' incarnation. It has to do with Jesus being enthroned as the Davidic heir, as a Davidic descendant who came to become a son of David to fulfill all the promises given to David. And I'm going to unpack that. Just walk with me. We're going to go slowly through this. Just bear with me. I'm just trying to show you what the issues are, right? Thank you, Oak. God bless you so much for your support. Right? So there is a type of sonship that Jesus enjoys that he didn't prior to a specific moment in time. In other words, Christ is God's son by nature, meaning as God, he's eternal son. But there's a sense in which he becomes God's son, a sense that he didn't experience before beforehand. You with me there? So when we talk about Jesus as God's son, depending on the context, that sonship may be referring to, to a type of sonship that does not relate to his eternal relationship to the Father. As God, he's the eternal son. But there is a type of sonship that Jesus experienced, enjoyed, took upon himself. A certain kind of sonship that he did not experience or become prior to a specific moment in his human experience and human existence are you with me there pedro you got it as god he's the eternal son but there is a type of sonship that jesus experienced that jesus became that jesus took to himself that wasn't true before the incarnation before a certain stage in his human existence The incarnation results in a new type of sonship. 
a new type of sonship that wouldn't be true prior to the incarnation. The incarnation is the first step towards that new type of sonship, a new experience as God's son. Okay, with me there so far? Because I'm going to prove it. Yeah, Chuck Musler is phenomenal. Chuck Musler is one of the best. He's with the Lord now, if, if I remember correctly. Okay, <clears throat> I'll get to that in a minute. I'm going to get to that in a minute. Just bear with me. Because I want to show you something that you missed in 1 Chronicles 22, verse 8. 1 Chronicles 22, verse 8. Exactly, Bill Thompson. 1 Chronicles 22, verse 8. Roy, you, you, you have no clue what you're talking about and you don't understand what I'm saying. I can't explain something that I just repeated several times. Go back and listen to the previous sessions because you have no idea what you're talking about because I did not say that. You're not listening. <clears throat> but the word of the Lord came to me saying, you have shed much blood and have made great wars. You shall not build a house for my name because you have shed much blood on earth in my sight. I want you to learn two things from this passage. Two things from what David says. One more time. First Chronicles 28 verse 8. One more time. Two important facts from this passage. I want you to glean two things from what David says to Solomon. Catch it again. Okay. Christos, you got it, brother. God bless you. You got it. The Holy Spirit's illuminating you. May he illuminate everyone, even Roy, for the glory of Christ. Guys, two facts to note from this. But the word of the Lord came to me saying, number one, Jesus told David this revelation of an everlasting dynasty that would be his by grace. Notice who told David, the word of the Lord came to me saying. Who's speaking to David? Jesus as the pre-human word of God. Did you catch it? The word of the Lord came to me saying, so Jesus, the word, in his preeminent existence, before he became flesh from his blessed mother, came to David and revealed David the following revelation. God has sworn to make you an everlasting dynasty. That's one, okay? The second point I want you to glean from this passage. Notice what Jesus told David. Jesus, the word of the Lord, coming to David, speaking to David, says, you cannot build me a house because you are a man of war and you've shed too much blood. The second fact I want you to notice, God did not endorse or condone all the wars and the bloodshed that was committed by the kings of Israel, including David. Not every war, not every bloodshed had God's approval. Just because the Bible mentioned it doesn't mean God <clears throat> confirmed it, was okay with it. Because you just read it right there. You cannot build me a house. You've shed too much blood and you fought too many wars. Even though I protected you from being killed and I had to guard you from being killed, you did what I didn't approve or command. One more time, First Chronicles 22, verse 8. Read it. Notice it again. But the word of the Lord came to me saying, you have shed much blood and I made great wars. You shall not build a house for my name because you have shed much blood on earth in my son. Sight, Lord, loosen my tongue to glorify you, Lord Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Did you catch it? You have killed too many people. You've shed too much blood. You've committed too much violence in the earth that I did not approve, David. And because of that, you've been disqualified from building the house for me. Thank you, Michael. God bless you, brother. No, sort of truth. You misquoted the text. Oh, yes, you did. I'm sorry, brother. God, forgive me, sort of truth. Lord, forgive me. You're right. 
May the Lord save me from error. You're talking about Bathsheba and Uriah. I thought you were talking about Michal, the daughter of Saul, that he took from her husband because it was rightfully his wife. Sorry about that, brother. I was confusing two stories. Now, notice what, again, David says in 1 Chronicles 28, verse 3. 1 Chronicles 28, verse 3. Why Solomon, not him, would build the house? Why did God say to David, you will not build a house, Solomon will? Okay, 1 Chronicles 28, verse 3. Now notice what David, uh, David says again. But God said to me, you shall not build a house for my name because you've been a man of war and have shed blood. Wait, wait, wait. Did you catch what David said? I disqualified myself from building a house for God because I killed too many people engage in too much warfare and shed too much blood that even God was upset with and did not approve. So much for the God of the Old Testament being, God forbids such blasphemy, a genocidal murderer. God forbids such blasphemy and lie against the word of God. Did you catch it? So what did you learn here? Here's what you learn. Not everything in the Bible that's recorded has God's approval. God did not approve of everything the Bible records. The Bible records these things because these are historical events, events that happen, actions that took place. It's like a newspaper reporter. A newspaper reporter reports crimes that the reporter doesn't agree with, but he has to report them because he can't lie or sugarcoat them. And the Bible is an honest, inspired record of actual historical events, much of which God did not approve but condemned. Exactly, and that's why it's called Chronicle. Chronicle. Okay, did you catch it? So two facts from First Chronicles 22.8. Jesus is speaking to David. Jesus is the word of God who in his preeminent existence came to the prophets and spoke to the prophets and revealed God. And Jesus told David, you've shed too much blood, you've engaged in too much warfare, therefore you cannot build me a house, you're disqualified because you put me in a situation that out of my love and grace for you, I had to save you from being killed even though I didn't condone the battles you engaged or the tactics you used. Thank you, Michael. God bless you. Did you get it now? Before I move on? So now, Ortho Christos, because two people asked me, Bozak, so it turns out, Bozak, you and I and Ortho Christos were all demented and weird because our minds operate in a very weird fashion. So you, Bozak, and Ortho Christos, right? You, Bozak, Ortho Christos, and myself, were three peas of a pod because we're demented and weird people because we think of weird questions when we hear something. So now I'm going to answer your question. What happened to Saul? Are you ready for that? What happened to Saul? Is that going to make your day? Are you going to be happy, Bozak? Ortho Christos, are you going to be happy too? You're going to make your day? Boo hoo hoo. Booyah shaka. You want the answer now? Please do. And send me some of your medicine because I need it too. So now, guys, bear witness. Ortho Christos, Bozak, and me, we are three deranged, demented individuals because we think of the wrong things and the wrong questions at the wrong time. At least I take solace in that I'm not the only demented nut in Christianity. I found two other like-minded souls. All right, you tell me if he was saved. Second Samuel 7, 14 and 15. Second Samuel 7, verses 14 and 15. <clears throat> I already have my mask on, Dominus. Can't you tell this is my mask? I'm actually better looking in real life. Okay, guys, Ortho Christos, Bozak, everyone else, tell me if Saul was saved. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men, 
but my mercy shall not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from before you. I will not take my covenant faithfulness, chesed, love from Solomon, even when he sends, as I took it away from Saul. First Chronicles 17, verses 13 and 14. Yep, I do. Holy sal uh, saliva. First Chronicles 17, verses 13 and 14. It's more than the kingship. It's not just kingship. It's more than the kingship. I will be his father, and he shall be my son, and I will not take my mercy away from him. I, I took it from him who was before you, and I will establish him in my house. And in my kingdom forever, and his throne shall be established forever. Okay. Further line of evidence. Saul was cut off. Read at your own leisure, 1 Samuel chapter 28. The entire chapter at your own leisure. Saul was desperate to hear from God. God would no longer speak to him in dreams and visions or through prophets or through Urim or Thummim through the priest. So he got so desperate that he disguised himself to go to a witch at Endor, hoping she could get a word from God for him. The spirit of Samuel shows up and he says, why have you disturbed me and raised me from my rest? God has cut you off and refuses to talk to you. He's done with you. Right there for Samuel 28. God is done with you. He wants to have nothing to do with you. That's why he's silent. He won't talk to you anymore. When God goes silent on you, that means you've reached the point of no return. It's over. You've now committed the sin that God will not forgive, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. So 1 Samuel 28. So when you take all these chapters together, what's the conclusion? God rejected Saul indefinitely because Saul had reached the point where he had grieved the spirit and committed what the New Testament would call the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, and therefore there was no repentance for him. Bozak, I'm going to answer your question, and you got to go, brother. Okay, Bozak, I'm going to post it, but you're going to get blocked. Forgive me because you're not paying attention. Post 2 Samuel 7, 14, 15, and Christos, I'm going to give you the honor of blocking Bozak because he just pretended to be listening. Because notice what he said about Solomon. Because notice the question Bozak just asked me. Yeah, but didn't he say he's going to take away the kingdom from Solomon? I'm going to now read it for you, Bozak, and you got to go, brother. This channel's not for you. Maybe you can go to Mike Winger or someone else. 2 Samuel 7, 14, and 15, and Christos, once he gets it, I want you to block the brother, right? For my peace and your peace. Protestant post 2 Samuel 7, 14, 15. I even was gracious enough to answer his question. you think he'd be gracious enough to read the passages and get the point. <clears throat> I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him. Bozak, we read this, and you still didn't pay attention. Christos. Please do me the honors. Please do me the honors. You understand why I got upset with this man? He not only distracted me with a question not relevant to the topic, Saul. When I answered the question and showed you what God said about Solomon, I will not take my mercy from him, which was repeated in 1 Chronicles 17, 13 and 14. He still has the audacity to ask me, yeah, but didn't God take the king away from Solomon? Okay, what do you want me to do? Ortho Christos, you got the point, didn't you? I like you too much to block you. Because if I block you, Ortho Christos, Anna Growing will beat me and punish me and won't let me hear the end of it. <clears throat> okay, but you got the point? See, exactly. I told you. Did everyone understand... God swore he would not cut off Solomon from his mercy, unlike Saul. Was that clear?
Did you guys get that? So you know the answer, right? Did God cut off Saul? Yes. Did he cut off Solomon for a sin? No, you just read it. Even if he sins, I'll punish him, but I will not cut off my mercy from him. Black and white in your face. It's right there. Shabazz, you want to stay in my room, right? Don't ask me that question. Clear? Now, glory to the chime God. May the Lord Jesus save us from distractions and save me from causing people to stumble and save me from having people cause me to stumble. You're getting it so far? Making sense? What Hebrews 1.5 is all about? What Hebrews 1.5 is all about? Let me answer the other question that's related. Yeah, but the passage says that Solomon's throne will be forever and his kingdom will be established forever. How can that be about Solomon? Well, it is about Solomon, but what's the answer? Because Sword of Truth brought that up. Here's the answer again. First Chronicles 28, 6 to 7. Here's the answer again. First Chronicles 20. Guys, let me encourage you. By the power of the Holy Spirit, it's not enough to read. You have to read with understanding from the Spirit and read slowly and simmer over the words because it's right there. He gives you the answer there. Notice, Solomon's throne would be forever if it's conditional. Here it is, verse 7. Moreover, I will establish his kingdom forever if, if, let me say it again, if he is steadfast to observe my commandments and my judgments as it is in this day. If, folks, you need to stop reading the Bible on a shallow level. It's right there in front of you. Say, Holy Spirit, open my, my eyes more and more. Speak to me to understand. It's right there. It, it told you in the text, not me. The word said his throne would be forever if he maintains obedience to my commands. Guess what? Solomon dropped the ball. Got it? It's right there. Folks, you underestimate the power, the beauty, the depth, the majesty of the Bible. You do. You do not realize how deep, how amazing, glorious, majestic the Bible is because the Bible is the word of the glorious, majestic God. Exactly, Ariel. Every jot and tittle. So let me explain what's going on here. God's promise to David that the throne is his is unconditional. Okay, let me explain it, guys. Here's where you're going to have to really pay attention. Okay? And I want you to take a moment tonight or during the week to read Psalm 89 at your own leisure. We may read it. We may read it now. Okay. Yeah, well, I think we're going to have to read it. Okay, let me explain to you the promise God made to David. God says, David, out of my love for you, out of my grace and compassion for you, I'm going to give you my earthly throne as your everlasting possession. You will have an everlasting dynasty. Okay? This throne I give to you unconditionally. It is yours and in your line forever. However, those who come after you will only sit on your throne conditionally. And here's the condition. They have to obey me. If not, I'll reject them and raise up another one of your sons to sit on the throne. You understand now? You understand what God is saying? So God says to David, my throne on earth is yours unconditionally. And it will be for your physical heirs. Only those who are your heirs physically, a son born to you from your line that can sit on your throne. But any son that sits on your throne after you 
must obey my covenant. This is the condition for them. The condition is they better maintain covenant faithfulness or I will reject them and replace them with another one of your sons. And that's what you find in the Old Testament. Right? So what was the condition to sit on David's throne? Number one, you had to be a physical son of David. Number two, you'd have to be the heir because David had many sons. Not every son qualified. The heir to the throne. And number three, once you're the heir, you better maintain covenant faithfulness or God would reject you and replace you with another son of David. You got it, sort of truth. Now you see how Jesus fulfills it. Because he's the only sinless, perfect, faultless son of David who can never be disqualified from sitting on the throne. You understand? The only sinless, faultless, perfect son of David who can never be disqualified from sitting on the throne and because he doesn't die can never be replaced. So that means, that means he is the last of the sons of David to sit on David's throne because he can't be replaced because he's deathless and he can never be disqualified because he's sinless. You see how it's pointing to Jesus now? You see how it's pointing to Jesus? It's all pointing to Jesus, right? All right. <clears throat> okay, now let's go to Psalm 89. Psalm 89, verses 19 and 20. Psalm 89, verses 19 and 20. God talking about his covenant to David. God talking about his covenant to David. Look what he says to David. Guys, hear, read. Please read. Then you spoke in a vision to your Holy One and said, I have given help to one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. I have found my servant David. I have found my servant David. With my holy oil, I have anointed him. My servant David, and I've anointed him with my holy oil. God is talking about his promise to David. Notice what God says about David, verses 26 and 27. 26 and 27. Watch here. Speaking to David, he shall cry to me. David will cry to me. You are my father. My God and the rock of my salvation. Wow, that sounds like Jesus. Also, I will make him, David, my firstborn, preeminent, the highest of the kings of the earth. So God is recounting his promise to David. David is my son. I am his, his, his father. He's my firstborn, meaning he's supreme, preeminent. Firstborn in the sense that not that he's the first king, but the highest king, the supreme king, whom all kings must be subject to. This is God talking about David. So David will realize, I'm his father, I'm his God, and the rock of his salvation who preserves him. And all kings must be subject to him because this king and no other is my preeminent son. That's what firstborn means. Now notice what it goes on to say about the covenant with David. 28 to 37, yes. Firstborn meaning preeminent in position. The highest in rank, higher than the rest. Now let's read the rest of it. 28 to 37. Watch God's promise to David. Watch. My mercy I will keep for him forever. My mercy I will keep for him forever. My covenant shall stand firm with him. His seed also I will make to endure forever. And his throne as the days of heaven. It's his throne. I've given it to him. I've gifted it to him. If his sons forsake my law and do not walk in my judgments, notice conditional. If they do not walk in my judgments, if, now notice 31, conditional. They break my statutes and do not keep my commandments. Then I will punish their transgressions with the rod. 
I will beat them with rods. Have men beat them with rods and their iniquity with stripes. I will have men beat them with rods and whip them. Whip them. Nevertheless, my loving kindness, I will not utterly take from David. You see, it's unconditional. Though I will beat his sons for disobedience, my covenant, I will not break with David. I'll remove them, but not the throne from David. I will keep the throne for David, but remove them. Read it. It's right there. Nevertheless, my loving kindness I will not utterly take from him, nor allow my faithfulness to fail. Now notice God swearing, right? My covenant I will not break, nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. How much more clear could God make it? This is an unconditional everlasting covenant. I will not lie to him. I've sworn by my holiness. I will not alter the words from my mouth. His seed shall endure forever and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever like the moon, even like the faithful witness in the sky. Selah. Do you see why the Jews were waiting for the Messiah? Because they took God at his word. They saw God said, I will not lie. I will not alter my covenant. I will not alter my words that I've spoken to David. This is his throne and it's forever. You see why they realize since God is not a liar, God cannot lie. Since God did say this to David, this is not a lie. David was an actual historical king. God did speak to him and promise him. And the Old Testament is God's word. God cannot lie. Therefore, there has to be a son of David to come to fulfill this promise. They're still waiting for him, but we're saying he already came. Did you catch it now? Now here's where it gets exciting. Here's where it gets exciting. God said, when his sons break my covenant, and he said this about Solomon. He said this about Solomon. I will beat him with the rods of men and the floggings of men. Guys, check me out on this. Prove me wrong. If you can find a single place in the Old Testament where Solomon or any of the sons of David were punished by, by men beating them with rods or floggings for breaking God's covenant, I will retire from teaching. And I will let Protestant teach and I'll post verses for him. Do you know why? Because that punishment was taken by Jesus. Why do you think Jesus got beat with the rods of men and the floggings of men? Because he was taking the punishment of the sons of David in his own person on their behalf. Jesus got beat with rods. Jesus got flogged by men. The punishment that the sons of David were to experience for breaking the covenant... Jesus experienced because he died in their place and took their punishment on their behalf. You got it now? Okay, now with that said, with that said, follow with me because... Five o'clock, which is right now my time, 404. Within 55 minutes, God willing, I go live with Al Fadi on Sir International on Facebook. With that said, God swore, My earthly throne that I gave to you, David, is forever and ever and ever. I will never revoke it. Your sons who sit on it, they have to meet a condition. They have to maintain covenant faithfulness or I will depose them and replace them with one of your sons. But rest assured, it's your throne forever. Okay. So what kind of sonship is this? This kind of sonship refers to David or his heirs sitting on God's throne on earth over God's people as God's representatives. The day in which they sit on God's earthly throne in Jerusalem that's the day God says, I have begotten you spiritually to be my son. You are my son. This is the day I have begotten you. This day that you took the throne to rule on earth in the place of David, 
This is the day I've made you my son spiritually. Right? So now, folks, this kind of sonship, which I call royal sonship, has specific qualifications. Number one, to be this kind of son, you must be a physical descendant of David. Number two, you must be the one appointed to sit on the throne of David on his behalf. And number three, you must begin ruling on the throne as David's heir. Okay, let me repeat again. To be this kind of son of God, you must be a physical son of David. You must be the heir to David's throne, and you must begin ruling on the throne as David's heir, right? Those are the three qualifications. Folks, let me ask you a question. Before Jesus became a son of David, a physical descendant of David, could he be that kind of son of God? Could he be the royal son of God? When royal sonship means you're a physical seed of David, the heir to David's throne, and you take the throne on David's behalf. So before he became flesh, could he or was he that kind of son of God? No. No. Okay. So the first thing Jesus needed to do was become a physical seed of David through his blessed, blessed mother, the Virgin Mary. Luke 1, 26 to 33. Luke 1, 26 to 33. And he had to be the heir to David's throne. We're not talking about legal sonship. That qualifies, but we're going to talk it to physical. Because Happy Cider, he has to be a physical seed. Not just legal. Physical. Okay, read with me. Now, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. To a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of, of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, member of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Now watch, watch, 31 to 33. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He'll be great and will be called the son of the, son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. David is his father, and David's throne is his. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. Did you guys catch it? Gabriel told Mary, the son you give birth to will inherit the throne of his father, David. Guys, please focus. Don't change the subject. Okay? Okay. You got it now? Let's go back to the prophecy of Peter in Acts 2. Acts 2, 29 to 33. Acts 2, 29 to 33. Acts 2, 29 to 33. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. <clears throat> okay, so David wasn't talking about himself. So who was David talking about? Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, a physical descendant, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. Oh, there you go again. A physical descendant of David will be the Christ. That Christ will sit on David's throne. So when did he sit on David's throne? Watch. He, for saying this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God, 
exalted after the resurrection in his flesh body, now immortal, taken to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this, which you now see and he hear. So in his physical flesh body, a flesh body, a human nature that makes him a physical descendant of David, he then went to heaven in that physical flesh body, making him a physical son of David, at sat at God's right hand to fulfill this other prophecy of David. Acts 2, 34 to 36. Acts 2, 34 to 36. We're almost done. Yep, Anna growing. Watch here. For David did not ascend into the heavens. Notice, for David did not ascend into heavens. But he says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. So David not only saw the physical resurrection of his physical descendant, the Christ, he also saw and wrote by the Spirit concerning the physical ascension of the Christ's Son, who is his Lord, into heaven to sit on God's throne at his right hand. David saw that and wrote about that too. Therefore, let all, yeah, Psalm 110, verse 1. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. I don't think you got it. When did Jesus become God's son in the sense that David became God's son, in the sense that Solomon became God's son, the human representative of God on earth sitting on God's throne in Jerusalem? When did Jesus become God's son in that sense? When he was raised physically, bodily, taken into heaven physically, bodily, and as a son of David, in respect to his human nature, sat on God's throne in heaven. Acts 13, 22 to 23, with 32 to 33. Okay, here. Acts 13, 22 to 23, with 32 to 33. Acts 13, 22 to 23, and 32 to 33. Watch here. And when he had removed him, he raised up for them David as king. To whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do, do all my will. From this man's seed, David's seed, David's physical seed, according to the promise, God raised up for Israel a savior, Jesus. Now notice what Paul quotes. He quotes Psalm 2 verse 7. And when was it fulfilled according to Paul? And we declare to you glad, glad tidings, that promise which was made to the fathers. God has fulfilled this for us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus as it is also written in the second psalm. You are my son, today I've begotten you. When did God fulfill Psalm 2-7 according to Paul? When God raised this Jesus who's the physical seed of David, because it was after the resurrection that God then exalted Jesus to sit on the throne. So when was Psalm 2-7 fulfilled? When did Jesus become God's son? What day is God referring to where he says to Jesus, today I have begotten you? What day? When he raised him from the dead to ascend into heaven to sit on the throne. Now let's go to Hebrews 1, verses 3 to 5. Hebrews 1, verses 3 to 5, and we're done. Hebrews 1, verses 3 to 5. <clears throat> Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged, our sins, notice, after he purged our sins by his death on the cross, resurrection, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. It's when he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, he became superior and better than the angels 
because he was lower than them in position while he was on earth, because he was on earth in the position of a slave, now exalted to be higher than them in position. He has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. And here is the fulfillment. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I've begotten you, and again, I will be a father to him, and he'll be a son to me. So do you see how they all agree? Do you see how they all agree? Psalm 2, verse 7, and 1 Chronicles 17, 13, were fulfilled when Jesus was raised on the third day in his physical body, in his glorified human nature, a human nature that makes him a physical son of David, and then in that physical body, ascended to heaven to sit on the throne at God's right hand. When he sat, then God says, Today, Jesus, you have been begotten to be my son. Yeah, if Jesus saves the second you, get him out of here. Get him out of here. He's being used of the devil like a little demon. It's a shame he's using such a beautiful name. You guys caught it? So when it says to Jesus, you are my son, today I've begotten you, it has nothing to do with the eternal relationship to the Father. It has nothing to do with his incarnation. It has to do with his ascension and exaltation to heaven to sit on the throne. Now he sits on heaven's throne, not only as God, but as a human being, a son of David. Let's go to Revelation 22, 16 so we can wrap things up. Revelation 22, 16, to wrap things up. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David. So right now, as I sit on my father's throne, I am still the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. So do you guys know how to answer Hebrews 1, 5? It has nothing to do with Jesus' eternal relationship to the Father as the Son. It has nothing to do with Jesus' incarnation. Today I have begotten you to be your Father has everything to do with Him being the Son of David, the heir to David's throne, taking the throne on David's behalf, and at His enthronement becoming God's Son in that sense in which David and Solomon became God's sons, his human representatives, his human rulers sitting on the throne to <clears throat> represent him and resemble his rule on the throne. You caught it? So this is talking about a different kind of sonship. Jesus becomes a certain type or kind of son of God. He's always been the son of God in respect to his divinity. As God, he's been God's eternally begotten son, right? But this is talking about a different kind of sonship, right? The royal son of God. But I don't think you got it now. I, still think, I don't think you still fully comprehend the implication of this. Remember, up until this point, David and his sons sat on which of God's thrones? There are two thrones during the time that God made this promise to David and his descendants. God's throne in heaven, God's throne on earth. Which throne was given to David and his sons? The one in heaven or the one on earth? You know what Jesus did? Jesus now sits on heaven's throne as a son of David. You understand what Jesus did? Now you have in heaven, for the first time in heaven's history, a human son of David on the heavenly throne. Something that never took place before Jesus' resurrection and ascension. Up until that point, only God sat on the throne in heaven. 
David and his son sat on God's earthly throne. This is the first time in the history of the creation of the heavens and the earth that a human being and a human son of David is ruling on God's throne in heaven. So now for the first time in heaven's existence, you have not only God, but the God-man, a man on the throne representing David on God's heavenly throne. So David has a human heir representing him on the throne of God in heaven. Uh, here we go. E, you want me to embarrass you and humiliate you? The dog is back here barking again. It is not superiority of kind, but a position, because Hebrews 1.3 already told you Jesus is the exact representation of God's being, which you floundered on like a rabid satanic dog. You hear barking again, dude? And this actually proves that you are a son of Satan. Yes, you're right. Dogs are cleaner than you. You're filthier than dogs. Because if Jesus was a mere created angel, then Hebrews 1.5 cannot apply to him. In fact, I'm going to embarrass you and I'm going to muzzle you. Do you believe Jesus is a human being in, in heaven? Do you believe Jesus is a human being in heaven? E-E-W. You're not a dog. You're the filth of dogs because dogs are cleaner than you. Do you believe Jesus is a human being in heaven? No, he's not. You see what a filthy dog he is? Because notice, he said he's not. But Hebrews 1.5 says, God never told an angel, you are my son, today I've begotten you. So you wicked son of Satan. How then can Hebrews 1.5 be true in your worldview, you wicked dog of the devil, when the point of Hebrews 1 is God never promised an angel to sit on the throne as a descendant of David. You wicked, vile, rabid dog, you disgusting swine of the devil. Okay. Now send him back to his father so he can continue to be spiritually manhandled by his father. You wicked, filthy hound of the devil. You swine. It's an insult to pigs and dogs to even mention you in the same breath. You see what they do to the scriptures, guys? You see how they blaspheme Jesus and butcher the scriptures? Hebrews 1.5 is clear. God never said to a created spirit angel, you are my son today, I've begotten you, because God never gave the throne to any created spirit angel and never made any created spirit angel a son of David to inherit David's throne. But this wicked, filthy dog believed Jesus is a spirit angel that was created, and he's not human, contradicting Hebrews and turning Hebrews' arguments on its head. Right? You with me there? Anyway, for the rest of you that are listening, yes, I want to mock you, wicked sons of the devil. Don't like it. Go to Mike Winger or go to the 20-hour apologist. Used to be the one-minute apologist. They'll be loving and kind, and they'll smile at you. Go to them, Mike Lacona, so they can smile at you. Yes, hi, brothers in Christ. Right? But now with that said, focus on the point so we can wrap things up. Focus on the point so we can wrap things up. For the first time in the history of heaven, in heaven's existence, okay? First time in heaven's existence, a human being sits on heaven's throne. A human being sits on heaven's throne. A human being represents David as his physical son, on heaven's throne. The first time in the existence of heaven that this happened. Never in the experience and existence of heaven did the angels ever behold a human being in a physical body on the throne with the Father. When Jesus died and rose again, he entered heaven not just as God who sits on the throne, but as the glorified, exalted human son of David sitting on the throne. And by virtue of being the God-man, as God, the throne is his. 
But as man, he has now dignified humanity by exalting humanity in such a way that you have a human now worthy enough to sit on the throne in heaven with the Father. See what Jesus did to humanity? You see the honor that Jesus confers on humanity and on David? Because he made humanity worthy. He exalted humanity, glorified humanity to be worthy enough to now reign with the Father on heaven's throne. That's Ephesians 2 verse 6. Ephesians 2 verse 6. Ivo, Ivo, if I have to explain that to you, you're never coming back to my channel. Ivo, do you want me to explain it to you? Because I don't want you back in my channel when I do. That Jesus is the angel of the Lord, but he never said to any angel, you are my son. If I explain it to you, you'll never come back to my channel. Agree? Ivo, we agree? Because I'm going to explain it, but I don't want you to come back. Can we agree on that? Because you didn't listen. God never said to a created spirit angel. The angel of the Lord is not a creature. He's an eternal divine person who functions as a messenger because that's what the word angel means. Hebrews 1 is talking about created spirit angels, created spirit messengers. Now, Ivo, you know you got to go now, right? Because if you've been paying attention to my sessions, listening to my sessions, not pretending to be listening, you would know the answer. Okay? For the rest of you paying attention, Ephesians 2, verse 6. Exactly. Who said he stops being human, Anthony? I began to talk. Go back and listen to the beginning. Folks, please, let me exhort you and also rebuke you. I just got done in the beginning of the session showing Jesus is a man in heaven and will remain man forever and ever and ever. Why is it hard for you guys to get it and ask me a question that I already addressed, not only in previous sessions, but in this session for Pleromic who came back? Why is it hard for you guys to focus? Now, you see why I try to control the comment section? Because of the chaos in the comment section, your minds wander. You don't learn. If you don't learn, how are you going to know this if you're not learning this? And how are you going to teach it if you don't know it? What's the point of teaching them? Amen, sort of truth. I want to use be used of the Spirit to make you fall so in love with Jesus and know the Word so perfectly no one can refute you and you take everyone captive for Jesus. Send Ivo to his mother because your mother has your pacifier and your mother has your blankie. Don't come back. How do we know that your mother is human and she gave birth to a human as opposed to a dog? Okay. Stupid questions. How do you know it's talking about uh, created angels? How do we know that your mother is human, that you're a human being? You can be disguised as a human being with a human voice. Yeah, how, how do we know that, man? How do we know that, sir? <laughs> and for those of you who want to know, do you want? how do I know it's talking about created angels? You guys want me to show you how I know it's talking about created spirit angels? Not the angel of the Lord is not a creature. Can I give you the answer for you guys? Can I give you the proof for you guys? Hebrews 1, 7 and 14. Hebrews 1, verse 7 and verse 14. Hebrews 1, 7 and verse 14. There you go. Hebrews 1, 7 and verse 14. Loki, can you get your original brain? Because we're looking for your original brain as you're looking for the original manuscripts. Hebrews 1, 7. And of the angels, he says, who makes, who makes. His angel spirits makes and his ministers a flame of fire. He made them to be what they are. And verse 14, are they not all ministering spirits? Serving spirits. They're created to serve. Send forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation. Could it be any clearer? It's talking about 
created angels. I just don't know how to read context. Even though in Hebrews 1, it's right there in front of my eyes. Because I don't like to read. I will listen to music that's not godly and watch movies that are not edifying. And I'll memorize the lines to music and lines to movies. But I can't memorize the Bible or learn to read context. It's right there in Hebrews 1. Surprise, Mike Winger. Hebrews 1, 7, one more time in case you didn't get it. In case it didn't sink in, Hebrews 1, 7. In case it didn't sink in. In case it didn't sink in. Hebrews 1, 7. One more time. Then we got to wrap it up. And of the angels, he says, he says, who makes... His angel spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. So they are ministers who are made to minister and to take on various forms and shapes. Are they not all ministering spirits? Spirits sent to serve. And they serve who? Sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation. <laughs> For the rest of you, though it was heated, and though we got distracted a lot by Satan and his children, where do you want me to go, Louisa? Louisa, where, where do you want me to go? Do you want me to go somewhere? Louisa wants to send me somewhere. I hope you understood it. I hope. Okay, but Louisa, I'm, all, I'm done. I did it already, Louisa. I'm finished. That's why I'm winding down. Louisa, I, I covered everything. So I'm winding down and showing how people are. Durr. Hey, Sam. I'm the Rain Man, Sam. My grandma and your grandma sitting on the fire. All right. I hope the signs of distractions you learned, right? Hebrews 1.5. Here's the takeaway. It has nothing to do with Christ's eternal relationship. It has nothing to do with Christ's incarnation. It has to do with Christ being coronated as the Davidic heir, the heir of David, the heir to David's promises as a human representative of David, inheriting David's throne as his human son, a throne that he now occupies on behalf of David in heaven. So what did Jesus do? The earthly throne of God as given to David has now been taken to heaven because in heaven, for the first time in heaven's existence and creation, a man sits on the throne with the Father. A human being sits on the throne with the Father. A human son of David sits on the throne with the Father, thereby now elevating humanity and giving them the authority to now reign with the Father in heaven. And that's Ephesians 2, verse 6. Ephesians 2, verse 6. Read that there, Ephesians 2, verse 6. Ephesians 2, verse 6. Because Jesus, the God-man, representing the Father to us and representing mankind to the Father, he has now elevated, dignified, glorified humanity and given humanity that's reconciled in him the right to sit with the Father and share in the Father's Sovereignty over creation. Ephesians 2 verse 6. There you go. And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. There's your answer. And the final point. These passages prove that just because someone is begotten. Remember this. To be begotten doesn't mean you didn't exist. These passages show that there are persons who already were alive, already existing, that were then later begotten. David was already alive when God begat him to be his son on the throne. 
Solomon was already alive and conscious and had existence and life before God begotten to sit on his throne. So these passages destroy the anti-Trinitarian argument and lie that if you're begotten, then you don't always exist. To be begotten means you didn't exist. According to who? These individuals already existed before they were begotten. So you don't beget something from non-existence into existence, from non-being into being, because these entities, these persons already had being, already had existence, already, already alive when they were begotten by God. Now you've destroyed and annihilated any and every major anti-Trinitarian objection against the eternal existence and reality of Jesus the Son. It's over for you Unitarians. You are sons and daughters of the devil. You are dogs and pigs of the devil, the filth of the devil, until and unless you repent, and be washed in the blood of the Lamb, Jesus the God-man. And until you do, that's what you are, and I will call you that, a dog, a swine, a filth, and the vomit of the devil. Right? Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. And Jesus Christ is Jehovah God Almighty in the flesh, the eternal Son of the Father, and the eternal companion of the Spirit, the one true God lives, and he is Father, his Son, and his eternal Spirit. And the Bible is the word of the one true God, who is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Not modalism, but the eternal triune God, whom we worship and love. And may we worship him perfectly, love him perfectly, and crucify our flesh. No more sin. Save me from my sins, Lord, not to fail you. And may the Lord Jesus return sooner than later. Maran. Athe. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Amen. In Jesus' name. Guys, was this a blessing? Were you still blessed in spite of the distractions? And I pray my, my voice was still pleasing to you because I cannot stand my voice. But I hope it blessed you. It challenged you. It stretched you. It made you stand more in awe of the depth and the beauty of the Bible and more in awe of the God of the Bible because we cannot love him enough we cannot thank him enough. We cannot know him enough. So let us love him more, know him more, trust in him more, seeking the spirit to help us. And please partner with me. Pray for me and my daughters. Ask Jesus to save me from my moral failures, to crucify my flesh, not to indulge it, to be pure for his glory, for the health I need, for the protection of my daughters, for their health, for the provision to do this until Jesus calls me home. And ask the Lord to protect me from corrupt legal systems and give me favor for his glory. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Lord willing, in 20 minutes, I go live again with Al Fadi on Sira, C I R A International. He's going to be live streaming it on YouTube and Facebook in 20 minutes. Lord Jesus willing, we love you, Son of God. Give us the power to love you perfectly and not to be hypocrites. Save me from my hypocrisy and my flesh. Bless them, Lord Jesus. Bless them and use me to bless them and love them and not be a stumbling block to them. Please, Lord Jesus, <clears throat> we love you. In Jesus' name, and pray for my health so that my voice never gives out so I can use it to glorify Christ till I die. Take care. Christ is risen, risen indeed.